Back to the Sermon on the Mount this morning. I'll tell you, we're going to be starting with verse 21 today. Uh, hard to believe this, but we're finally going to begin the teaching section of the sermon. Twelve weeks have all been introduction. Uh, if you ever want to pick on me for a long introduction, I want you to come back to this sermon and look at how long it took Jesus to get the people ready to listen to the sermon. Because that's really where it starts here in verse 21. The teaching that he has come to deliver, the understanding he wants them to gather into, is going to start now. And he's had to prepare them because no one was ready for this sermon. Everyone has come to hear him speak. Everyone has arrived for this. We said large crowds have gathered. He has moved up this mountainside, found that space where the people can gather around. But they're not ready to hear. They have been hungry for a Messiah. They believe this might be the Messiah has arrived. And they're not ready to understand what he has come to do. And this is what he has tried to prepare them for here, to lay this out to them. Because they have all come with expectations that he is not going to meet. They have all come with what is built up over Jewish tradition and Jewish history as an idea of what the Messiah is supposed to be, and he is going to tell them that is not at all what he has come to do. And to move them from that expectation to prepare them for a reality has been the first part of this. To tell them what they're... And remember those expectations that have built over the years. This is the most frustrated people on the planet. They have moved from one oppressive regime to another, one empire after another, conquering them, laying them low, embarrassing them before the world. They are the most trod upon people that have probably ever existed. And they have built up an understanding that a Messiah has to come and end that political and end that emotional pain. And Jesus begins with something, and one of the first things he tells them, I have not come to change your political condition. I've not come to deal with Rome at all. I've come to deal with you. And his opening part is to say the problem that exists is not how the world treats you, but that you are not prepared to be in a relationship with a living God. Now, can you imagine how that hit these people? Because how did they view themselves? The chosen ones. They are the chosen ones. And is that true? Yes. Yes, yes it is. Chosen to do what? God. To serve God and to be in a relationship with a living God. And they have changed that into a set of rules and regulations. It is no longer a living relationship with God. And this is what he has to address here. God has come to make a change. And the first thing he has to change is this. You are not prepared to enter the kingdom, he tells them. You are not even prepared to be a member of this kingdom, much less have He bestow all its blessings on you, because what has to change is not your political condition, but the condition of your heart. Your heart. And so He begins, and He talks in the Beatitudes, and He says, this is the character of a people ready to see the kingdom. The first thing He says that has to change is you. Rather than transforming the conditions in which you live, I need to transform the conditions of your life. What you are is what he needs to change here. So he needs to bring him into a humility, and that's his beginning point. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Jewish pride is demanding a change. And Christ begins with demanding Jewish humility. A change in attitude to be prepared to understand God. So he shocks them with this. And he goes further than that. He says that when you change this character, when you become a people ready for the kingdom, guess what? Things aren't likely to get better. Notice how he ends the Beatitudes. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of things of evil against you because of me. Notice what he says. Guess what? When you become prepared for the kingdom, when you adopt the character of the kingdom, when you are ready and enter the kingdom, the first thing that's going to happen is things aren't going to get better. They might just get worse. worse. Because here's what he says. I'm not going to take you out of this dark and evil world. I'm not going to end the oppressors yet. As a matter of fact, I'm going to transform you into a people ready to make a change as salt and light in this world which is going to go in and you're going to go in against the corruption of this world as salt. You're going to reveal the corruption of this world as light. And the world's not going to like it. They might just react. 
and I'm sending in you to get a reaction. I'm sending you back into this dark world to live in the midst of this for a time. For a time, he says. That is what's going to have to happen. So the first thing he shocks him and says, we're not going to solve your problems, at least the problems that you think you have. The next thing he does is he looks at them and he addresses the next problem, and that is this. You're not even worshiping with the right faith. You don't understand what the Messiah is supposed to be. What's worse is you don't understand what you're supposed to be because you've changed the faith I gave you. You've created a whole new legalistic type of activity that has nothing to do with what God said. You have adopted the per profession of man, the uh, types of mores and concepts of human religion, and you are not doing what I said. And he goes through this. He says, you think you're having a problem. Here's the twofold problem Israel had. On the one hand, this religious system that is built up, that has been created by these human understandings, is very complex. It has all kinds of rules. Remember we went through all those rules and some of the, some of the not all of it, a number of those rules. Try this one. They had one negative rule for each day of the year that you had to memorize about what you should not do. Then they had a few hundred of positive rules that you, but for every day of the year you had to memorize a new bad rule of what you should not do. This was how involved they got in this legalism. And so they had created this whole thing, and on the one hand, Israel is frustrated by it. As we said, the average person has about how much time when you're making a living to try to get involved with these hundreds of minute rules, to try to sift through this and figure out what it takes to make God happy, because that's what they believed. It was all about following these rules. So on the one hand, there's frustration. They think the law has become too complicated and the standard has been set too high to please God. It's set too high. We've got to get a simpler approach to this. Yet on the flip side of this, the Jews took a great deal of a sense of accomplishment and a sense of superiority out of their law because they looked at their complex law and all their moral code and they said, here's what we try to follow. Let's compare that to the rest of the world. And how does that tend to make you feel when you go, I've got this great moral code and the rest of the world is a mess? Yeah, we're the top ones. You know, here we are. Maybe it's complicated, but it's better than what anybody else is doing. And now Jesus is going to address that. And he's going to say a couple of things to them they hadn't quite expected. One, I didn't come to make things simpler for you. Notice what he says. Do not think in verse 20 or 17, I should say, that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth until heaven and earth disappear. Not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of the pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Now, if you're listening as a Jew there, you've been wanting to get this simpler approach to things, you want to get a, a simpler list of do's and don'ts, how's this going to make you feel? Yeah. Now, he's not talking about scribes and the Pharisees' laws. He's talking about his law, right? And there's the distinction. And this is now why I say we've come to the teaching section. He needs to make them understand the difference between what they understood as law and what the law really was. Because he's saying God's law doesn't change. And understand, we're going to get into this in this very next section here. Here's one of the things he has set up with that statement. He is saying God's law cannot be changed by man. Not one stroke of it. Now I want you to think about this. For generations now, rabbis, scribes, Pharisees have been going through and writing out this complex law of God. What were they doing? They were changing it. They were going through and giving it new understanding and new meaning. They completely altered it. And this is the place he is starting that dividing line. You don't know what the law is. Your frustration was the system that does not even is not even supposed to exist. And he's going to try to draw this parallel between these two and make them understand this in these contrasts. So on the one hand, he's saying the standard's going to get tougher. On the other hand, he says, your pride and anger, or your pride in yourself is going to be stripped away because we're going to have to look at things the way they really are. So he's going to come down to this. 
He makes a clear statement about the real law, and then starting in Matthew 5, 21, he's going to give six illustrations to make you understand the distinction between how man viewed the law and what the law really is. This is what he's going to try to make them understand. And he's going to make them understand this. The problem you have is, is not that the things have become too complex. It is not that the scribes and Pharisees and the rabbis have lifted the standard with all these new writings. They have lowered it. And we need to take it back up to an understanding that God has a much higher standard than all that you have ever written, all that you've ever tried to make people understand. You have a pride in a system that has stripped God's law of its real meaning. So now this is what he has to try to address here. We're going to try to try to see this and see if we can come up with that understanding and get to this. And understand the shock of what they're probably trying to face here. We need... I'm not going to actually get into any of those verses today. <laughs> this is an introduction to those verses because you need to understand where we're going with this and try to set up the basis of what we're going to study. I'm going to let you know that we're going to deal with some of the most controversial stuff the church deals with in terms of doctrine and issues. I also will warn you, you not everyone may be satisfied with what I do with it when we get done. But we are going to try to understand it as it is being really laid out and what it really means here. Let me give you a basis for something here of what Jesus is contrasting and why he's trying to make them understand something differently. Most of us evaluate life in a very simple way. We evaluate life and its value of ourselves by what we do or do not do. That is how we evaluate things. Men especially are good at this. You see the two guys meet in the street. John, good to meet you. Myron Hawthorne. John Rogers. What's the first thing I'm going to ask you? What do you do for a living? What do you do for a living? You're a teacher. Well, now I got to come up with something better than that. Because <laughs> the competition has begun. And we've got to arrive. So I've got to come up with some. I can't just tell you, well, I build things. No, I've got to tell you how impressive it is what I do. And we do these things. We start a comparative. Men are very especially focused on this. We evaluate the value of our lives by what we do for a living. Even women in the workplace don't tend to do that as much as men do. This is why men have such a terrible time in retirement. That's why I'm so miserable now. <laughs> I don't do anything that matters anymore. That's how we tend to work at it. And we struggle with that def definition of the thing. We also do this in our moral code because it's simpler than anything else. As much as it doesn't make us happy, we make a comparison between what we do that other people don't do or what we don't do that other bad people do. And that's how we evaluate how good we are and where we stand in relation to one another. That's the simple approach. And Jesus is going to attack that. He's going to say we can't define character that way. Here's what he says in 1 Samuel 16, 7. Man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. Now remember this. We've talked about how do you define the heart in Scripture? How you think. It's the mind. God looks at how you think. What is your motive? What is behind what you do? And you're going to break that all down here. God is never fooled by that. We are. What are you thinking? What's your attitude? What are the specifics of what's going on there? Here is where Jesus is going to go after something that really shouldn't surprise us. If you've been a parent, you've been here. You know this one. We want more than just obedience. Don't we? You ever have, you've had these experiences. Here it comes. Parental gyms in the moment. You tell the child to do something, and they do it, and you're not satisfied. Why? Attitude. What attitude are we talking about? I don't want to do it, but I'm going to do it anyway. The one I want you to go put those dishes in the dishwasher. The kid goes in and goes, there it is. <laughs> it's in there. Oh, evidently we have support with this one. It's in there. And we have now we've got the moment. They did what you told them to do. As a matter of fact, when you confront them and say, What are you doing? What you told me. You told me to put it in there. What's the problem? And what is the problem? Didn't do it right. They didn't do it. That was the attitude. And there we have all those things. Don't be. 
Don't look, look at me. Look me in the eye when we're talking. Don't you be looking down. The, don't roll your eyes at me, young man. And we have all these things. Now we start talking about it. Change your tone. What tone are you talking about? That tone. <laughs> And we have this whole thing going on, and the child is feigning complete ignorance by saying, I did what you told me to do. I am as innocent and pure as the driven snow. What's the problem? This is where Jesus is taking us in these six illustrations. Precisely where he's taking us to look at this. What is it that's going on behind the scenes. What's in your mind? Proverbs 16.2 says that all men seem innocent to him. I like that one. Don't they? Isn't that what the child feigns? Innocent? What? I don't understand the thing you're talking about. Always seem innocent to him. But motives are weighed by the Lord. Jeremiah 17 says that God searches the heart and the conscience. The critical standard from God is the condition of what you're thinking. What are you motivated? I saw a hand out here somewhere. John. John, yeah. Sure. I passed it by. I passed it by. Sorry. What are you talking about? He wants to look at this. It's an issue of character. Here's the next thing that we always try to work with our children. Trying to get them to do something the right way again. The attitude that comes into this. They get a gift. What do you tell them they need to do immediately? Thank, thank you. you. Say thank you. Then they do. Thanks. Because <laughs> it's not the gift they want. They got that sweater from Grandma that you wouldn't even wear. <laughs> but you're going to make them wear it all day on Christmas. There you go. The classic <laughs> from the stupid show. These moments. And then we come back to it again adjusting the attitude and here we are again did you like the gift <clears throat> no what are we telling to really thank that person for the thought behind it the, adjust your attitude go say it with a joke trying to get that thing in there about how we think about it. we try to get the child to stop and think no let's look past the sweater and remember what was behind this what is driving this? Why should I be thankful? This is where God sorts us out time and time again, trying to get us to move to understand and see past what we're focused on and to have an attitude that changes appropriately. To develop a people of character. Changing the character. Isn't that the biggest challenge? Getting someone to be a person of character. To get them past just doing what they should do and adopting an attitude that says, I want to do this because it's the right thing, regardless of whether the circumstances are meeting my expectations in the moment. And this is where Jesus is going to take us. He's already set the ultimate standard. We have to live by God's standards, and now he's going to explain God's standards. He's got to get us ready to do this, because understand this, if we're going to be salt and light, it cannot just be about the do's and don'ts that govern us outwardly. We have to impact the character of the world, and that means you must be a people of character. And understand that the world is watching for any slip-up that would say that what you're claiming and what you're teaching is clearly, patently, not something you hold to. You are a hypocrite. In some regard, they want to find that. And you cannot maintain enough do's and don'ts to prevent some moment from occurring where they will find reason to say, I knew it, you're not what you claim to be. So he has to address this. He's going to do it with six statements where he's going to go after this. And each of these statements is going to begin with this phrase, you have heard it said. You have heard this let me tell you something different. All six of them are going to start with that. Now it's interesting that he has just said, I did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. And he says nothing's going to change. Now remember, we said the Jews saw the law different ways. Sometimes when they talked about the law, they only talked about the Ten Commandments. 
Sometimes they expanded. They meant by the law, the entire of Mosaic law and the Pentateuch. Sometimes when you said the law, it meant the entire Old Testament. Jesus has just said the law and the prophets, meaning he's referring not to the Ten Commandments, not to just what Moses said, but to the entire Old Testament. He's now going to choose six examples. Two of these are going to come from the Ten Commandments. Two of these are going to come from the, the broader Mosaic Law, and two of them are going to talk about love that come from the broader thing of prophetic ministry and the statements about the character of God. He's going to give six examples that are going to cover the entirety of the Old Testament understanding of truth. That's how he's going to drive this home. So he begins with this. Now let me read something to you. I'm going to see if a different translation. The very first one, You have heard it said to the people long ago. Anybody got a different take on that? The ancients were told. The ancients were How does yours read? You've heard that it was said to our ancestors. You've heard that it was said to our ancestors. Does anybody have a different word than to? To those of old. To those of old, okay. That the ancients were told. That the ancients were told. Okay, now you're getting a little closer here. The Greek structure here gives us two options. You can either read this way. You have heard it said to the people long ago or to the people of old. Or you can read this way. You have heard it said by the people from long ago. The Greek allows us either translation. So when we have a problem where you can translate it either way, how do we decide which way to go? How it goes in the scripture. Context. How it's used, context. You have to look at the context. Here's the context question. Which one fits our context better? I want you to think about this for a moment. Here's your test. Here's your chance. You're, you're studying the Bible. You've done your Greek studies. You've all finished your Master's in Divinity. And you've come to this moment. You're translating. Which way do you want to translate this from the context? Say that you can. Here it is again. First one. You have heard it said to the people long ago. You have heard it said by the people of long ago. Self-interpretation. Okay. Distinction. Understand what Jesus is about to do. He's about to say, you have heard this said, and I'm telling you something completely different. They got it wrong. If the word is to in here, the natural understanding was that you have heard it said to the people from long ago. Who would have likely said it long ago? The prophets. God would have spoken it. Now Jesus is going to have to say, here's what God said then, but now let me tell you it's completely different. I'm overturning this. I'm telling you something different. If he's doing that, why did he say back in verse 18 or 17, do not think that I have come to abolish the law of the prophets? If he's going to say, I'm changing nothing, not the least stroke of the pen, how in the world, a few verses later, could he say, here's the first thing I'm going to do. This is what God used to say. Let me tell you something new. Huh. Wouldn't make any sense. I'm going to tell you, I believe we should have the word by in here. The Greek in this particular case allows the Greek word. But this is because this is written originally in Greek here, what we're talking about, the original text was here that we're dealing with, the so Greek Mark, grammar. Yes. It's like it's like um, um, it's like a, a testimony. The word by is third party, the word to is you were there. It's direct. It's direct. To is something to that would have been told to the people from an outside source in this case. By their natural possible. understanding, we're talking about the word of God. It had to be God telling the people as this thing. But if he's going by, here's where we come. He is going to contrast what they have been taught for generations now by a group of men, rabbis, authorities, scribes, and scholars who have decided what the word means and tell the people here is the only way to understand it. And Jesus is now going to come back as, I know you've heard it said by these guys, let me tell you what was really said. Do you understand the distinction here now? Yeah. That's what's going to happen here. He, couldn't, he can't be abolishing the law. It's important to understand he's not changing this. He's going to stretch the people's thinking here. 
There's a higher standard, and all six illustrations are going to run that home. He needs to make them understand what God really said. I don't know if you're aware of this, but here's the problem that occurred. And very much there's a parallel in our own church history in the era of the Reformation that follows this same pattern. The average Jew did not speak Hebrew commonly. You know what language they spoke at the time that Jesus is speaking here? Aramaic. Aramaic. What is all the scripture written in? Hebrew. Understand, the average Jew did not really have the capacity to sit down and read through it because their understanding of Hebrew was very limited for the average Jew at this time. So who were the only people that could go back and read the text in Hebrew and what it really said? The scribes, Pharisees, Pharisees, the rabbis, the more learned, the people who had this capacity. They had an exclusive access to this back, the Bible. And in that exclusive access, they now had given an exclusive understanding of it that only they could comment on. And that is why it has become common now, when you went through and you read the Old Testament text, the thing you did was not sit down and let's figure out what God said. It had become common to say, what did the last great rabbi say about this passage? And what they often had was a Bible laid out, and in the margins were all the commentary that had built up over the years, and all the authority didn't come from the text, it came from the margins, and the comments in the margins. They were reading between the lines. They were creating whole new lines. Red letter edition. I have a red letter edition, unfortunately, I hate those. But anyway... <laughs> In the time of the Reformation, understand, it was not common that people could even read. If they did, they often read in their own language, and guess what all of the scripture tended to be available at the time? Latin, which was only understood by the priest and so forth. And they tended to do something. They went back and they had in the margins the commentary by past priests about what the text meant. And it became common for most priests to check the authority of the previous highly regarded men of the church rather than read the text. In fact, it became common to believe you should not let the people read because the last thing we want is someone coming in here and reading the actual text and coming up with their own ideas about what is said here. Like Martin Luther. There, see what happened when he opened the door? Bad things happen. And here we have the same thing. We have this idea that we appeal to scholarship rather than appeal to what God actually said. And this is what Jesus is going to address with this. We don't want anyone getting too close to understanding the text or making waves or changing what we've established here. And Israel is in that moment. And so Jesus is going to do this. In fact, note what he says here. It was said by people long ago, or by the men of old. There's another way you can actually lay that out. Now, I want you to understand something. Here's how the Jew understood what we said. When you had a person of high particular scholarship, you talked about the men of old. And the men of old referred to the special select group that really understood things, the smart guys that we can appeal to to tell us what is true and what isn't. And he is appealing to that very thing. You've heard it said by your scholars, the people you revere, this is what the text says. And in contrast, what's he going to say? But I say. Now I want you to understand that one. Here's a very interesting moment. He's going to say, but here's what I say. Do you understand the departure here? The first is, he is not going to do what every other rabbi does and appeal to past scholarship. I don't care what any of the scholars said. I'm going to tell you what it really means. In, a, in the standard Jew's mind, can you understand what they're hearing here is an incredible level of arrogance. I am throwing out every scholar you have, no matter what they said, and I've got a completely different understanding that I'm going to tell you. Now, some people thought maybe as a prophet, but do you notice the difference between what he says and what a prophet said? What did the prophet say? God says it was written. Thus saith the Lord, as it is written, they make a reference back to God. They make it plain. I don't have the authority to tell you this. 
I'm not the final guy to tell you what this means. As a matter of fact, if you look through, you remember what they said often? The prophets would look into their own writings to try to figure out what God had just said. <laughs> you that? I'm the prophet. God tells me, I write this down. You write it down, you go, what in the world does that mean? I just said that. I have no clue what it means. That's an incredible thing. Jesus here does not appeal as a prophet. He doesn't say, let me tell you only what God said. He says, let me tell you, I'm going to explain what God said because I'm the only guy who can get it right. Do you see the difference here? The way he is staking out? What he is saying before these people? He has done something very clever here and something very important to your understanding. That you've come here, who is this guy? Who does Jesus say that he is? As I said, a lot of scholars come back here. I love it going to the college I used to work at, the, the Bible study department there with religious studies, I should say, because we don't just talk about the Bible, it's religious studies. But all the things were, you know, Jesus did not see himself the way they wanted him to be. Jesus never thought he was that guy. What does he say here? Right off the bat, by making that claim in this level of authority. I am. I don't have to ask anybody else's opinion. I don't have to even look it up if I don't want to. He quotes scripture all the time. But he's saying right here, I really don't even have to do that because I was the guy writing it. This is where he is taking out his turn. He is saying, a lot of the people are saying, are you a prophet? If they just listened to those words, nobody would have asked that question. He just said, I'm not talking like one of the prophets. Are you just a rabbi or a teacher? No, because I've just raised myself above every rabbi who's ever lived. Here is where he stakes out a position that is solely unique. And everybody there understood it. All the people that want to come to this and say that Jesus is hard to figure out what he really thought about himself. Just read the text. He doesn't hide anything here. I'm telling you the way that it is. I'm going to lay it out for you. No one else has the authority to do this but me. This is a seminal moment in his ministry. If they are wondering, is this the Messiah? Is he laying claim to that title right here? He does. Because only the Messiah, not a prophet, would have a right to make this claim on himself. As we come to these, I want you to understand that Jesus is exercising authority to make us understand this is how you need to view Scripture. This is how you need to view it. You heard it said by people long ago, do not murder, he's going to say. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. And here's the distinction he's going to start. But I tell you, I tell you. And there he's going to go with all six of these. As we said, in each and every case, drawing from Old Testament, first from the Ten Commandments, then from the Pentateuch, and then from the Scripture at large on the issues of love. Let me give you some principles that I want you to have for starting this as we're going to study this together. First, the spirit of the law is the priority over the letter. Now, be careful about that because I'm not saying the letter of the law doesn't matter. But God is trying to tell us here that we need to understand the intent behind what is said. Let's go back to what I was talking about with parents. We are looking for more than just physical following of the commandments. We are looking for a character that understands how it is applied that changes what you are. The whole point is to change what you are. Change hearts. It is not just God's rules. I want you to understand. The law is not a rule book. It is a statement of God's character. Every law that we find in the Old Testament is a statement of God's character. Why is it a rule? Because that is what God is. It is a statement of how he thinks, how he views life, and that is what we have to look at. Second, the law is not just negative, but positive. It wasn't just given to prevent us from doing things. 
It was given to motivate us to change how we think and act. It is given to change the character of the person. It is, as we put these things out, it is made to humble people, peacemakers, people who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Third, the law is not an end to itself. This is where the Jews had failed miserably. They believed the law was the means of salvation. The law is this, if I do this, God has to take me to heaven. What was the law really given for? I mean, how bad you were. To make us aware of sin. That is its purpose. The whole thing that Israel was missing. Why did they not have a relationship with the living God? Because they had never come to grips with what the law was intended to do. And that is to tell you, I need to approach God as a person recognizing I have nothing but for the grace of what God might give me. Has to change that. Fourth, try this one, and I know it's going to be hard for some of you who really think you are great about this. Only God can actually judge a person's character. Yeah, I know. Kind of hurts. Especially some of us who think that. Because, you know, have you ever, ever had a sense that you're, you're usually a pretty good judge of a person? That could, you have yeah, that insight? I'm pretty good about reading people. I hear people say, oh, I'm pretty good about reading people. Maybe you are. But here's the real problem. No matter how good you are, you can be fooled especially by one individual who has the best record of lying to you and tricking you of any person you've ever come in contact with, which is yourself. yourself. <laughs> it is yourself. I want to take you to something here. Passage I want. This is from 1 Corinthians. This is Paul, 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Paul starts talking about judgment here. Starting in verse 2, Now it's required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. I care very little if I am judged by you. There, you like that part, don't you? Don't we like to have that, I don't care what anybody thinks. That's not what he's saying, however. Or by any human court. Indeed, I do not even judge myself. Now there's a weird one. Why is he saying that? Aren't we supposed to evaluate our motives and actions? Well, Paul says, yeah, we are supposed to, but he says, but I'm not going to do it by my standards. Because if I do it by my standards, you know how I'm going to do it? What's that? Unfairly. Unfairly. Weighted in my favor. <laughs> because I always come out better when I make up the rules myself. Because I'm not even judge myself. My conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. You notice that? What is he saying about his own character? He's prejudiced. I'm prejudiced in favor of myself, and I know I lie to myself. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait till the Lord comes, he says. Now you say, well, I can't do anything until God comes. No. He will bring to light what is hidden in the darkness and will express the motives of men's heart. He's saying ultimately there will be that judgment. At that time, each will receive his praise from God. Now, brothers, I have applied these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, so that you may learn from us the meaning of the saying, do not be go beyond what is written. Now, he's saying, ultimately, even the best of us, it's going to be God that's going to determine all the motives in the final analysis. But for right now, if I'm going to make any judgment about motive, action, conduct, truth, or lies, where do I need to go? Scripture, where it is written. That's where I need to go to get this right if I have any chance of making a judgment that makes any sense at all. Don't assume you can read a person's heart. Hebrews 4.12, a discerner of the thoughts and intents of God is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of men. And fifth, all of us are commanded to live up a divine to live to a divine standard. Understand that ultimately it is not any human list, it is not your personal list or your comparative list, which is our favorite. It comes down to a divine list, and the divine list standard is this. You have to meet a perfect standard. Why should you always remember that? 
You can't do it. You can't do it by yourself. And it's going to force us back to the beginning of that humility again, mourning over our sin and returning to God to get things put right. This is our beginning point for these six things. As we start to look at what Jesus says in contrast to what they have heard, these need to be the beginning points to understand it as we get into it. Let's close this out.